welcome to the Overdue Podcast, Episode 2. I'm Kelly, one of the librarians at Madison College, and with me are my fellow librarians, Mark. Hello. Christina. Hi there. And a special guest today, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Jennifer is one of the librarians here at Madison College as well. She's the science and math liaison for our libraries, and we're going to talk to her about recent developments and access to climate change information. In addition to talking with Jennifer, we will announce the book you voted for to read for our Overdue Book Club. Christina will have a segment on book covers, and we'll have some more trivial observations with Mark. And of course, we will share our Anything Goes recommendations. All right, so our first segment is going to be the book club update. The vote for the book club has been going on for over two weeks now, and it looks like we have a winner for this semester's book club. This semester, we will be exploring the theme of climate fiction, or cli-fi, through the book, and this is where you'd put the drum roll mark, Memory of Water, by Finnish author Emmy I. Taranta, and I'm sure I butchered that. Sorry, Emmy. It's been an anxiety-producing few weeks watching the votes progress, and it has led us to wonder how much the images of the book covers might have influenced the votes. Sure. Yes. <laughs> We want to thank everyone who visited our book club website to cast a vote. If you have reserved a copy of the title, we will have one coming your way. If you're interested in reserving one, head over to the book club's website at www.libguides.madisoncollege.edu forward slash book club and fill out the form on the first page. We will meet in about a month to discuss the book in person. Be sure to check out our guide for dates and times, as well as to fill out our interactive polls, find future podcast episodes, and engage in online dialogue in our Goodreads page. Thanks again, and happy reading. All right, so our next segment is Christina, and she's going to talk to us about uh, book covers. Yeah. So like you said, um, we had our voting for our book club winner, and I wanted to show everybody just to kind of refresh their memory of what the book, the book club winner, um, the cover looks like. So I have it here for everybody, The Memory of Water, yeah. and it's a pretty engaging book cover, mm -hmm. I have to say. Yeah. Yes. Um, so this kind of made me think a lot about book covers, um, kind of what goes into them, the design of book covers, um, a lot goes into the design. I was reading about them, everything from color choice to the font that's used. Um, it all can communicate a lot about not only what the book's about, um, but also try to engage the reader with the story. Um, but interestingly, um, can also tell us a lot about the time period that a book was published. And I actually found this Speaking of book cover books, a book in our own Madison College Library called By Its Cover, Modern American Book Cover Design, and I thought it had a really interesting quote at the beginning. It says that the cover is a book's first communication to the reader, a graphic representation not simply of its content, but of its point in history, in the history of American design, in the history of American literature, in the history of American culture. Books and their covers are vital, physical manifestations of an evolving American intellectual tradition, and in retrospect, the most intelligently designed covers of American books recall particular moments in our cultural memory. The designs conjure up associations of our personal and collective encounters with the groundbreaking intellectual expressions of our times. They define what we were, what we hope to be, and sometimes what we have become. So this was a really interesting book. Um, it's by Ned Drew and Paul Sternberger. It talks about kind of the history of, um, of book design in America. Right. So this kind of got me thinking about um, our book. Our, um, our book cover was designed by somebody named Adam Johnson. Um, he's a graphic designer, and I was actually able to track down his LinkedIn profile. Um, <laughs> so believe it or not, yes. Uh, he lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he's designed about three book covers that I could find for oh. Hi um, Hyperion. Should we describe the book cover um, if, in case people are not looking at it right now? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so my kind of question for the group today was, based on the cover for Memory of Water, 
what do you think the book is about? Um, does it give you a sense of the tone of the book, the mood, um, any kind of um, stereotypes you want to make about its content, or is it foreshadowing anything for you in terms of what the book is going to be like? Yeah, I don't know. I, she has very engaging ice blue eyes and blonde hair. The colors are calming, gray and blue. My first impression when I saw the cover was that it kind of shouted young adult. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yep, definitely. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of the other book covers that our book cover designer um, designed were young adult books. Mm. Um, let's see, here's one example and we can um, put a picture of this on our book club um, website for people to look at, a book called Dead Set by Richard Cadry. Um, and here was another one that he designed called The Dead Run, another young adult book. Yeah. Um, what about you, Jennifer? Anything you're looking forward to in terms of this book based on its cover? At this point, we are judging the book by its cover, literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't actually read any of the books yet, but I have to say I was definitely more drawn to this cover than to the other covers, particularly the one that had a dead frog on the in front the of road. it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I, I think that might have been in last place with the voting, Yeah, that's too bad, because oh, it, yeah. it was, having read all the books, um, I'll say that uh, they, were, they were all very good, and uh, yeah, it's too bad that a, a frog turns people off so much. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. A dead frog. Yeah, yeah. he's a happy frog. Um, he's a happy yeah. frog. We yeah. might feel differently about it. <laughs> but I know, at least in my past, um, you know, the book covers can have a big influence on me on whether I choose to pick up a book um, and take the time to read it. Um, so I'm curious to see how this book's tone kind of compares with the cover. And as we go along and read the book, um, I guess we'll find that out. The other thing with the eyes, and uh, people mention that they're strike, to me it uh, kind of it, um, gives a spooky tone. Yeah, to, to me, it. her eyes, I mean, they kind of reminded me of, like, Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. first episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, what are they, the walkers? The, uh, the others. The others, yeah, yes. Right. So I'm like, is there something supernatural here mm -hmm. going on? Right, um, exactly. So I don't, I haven't read the book. I don't know if there's a supernatural element, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was, based on the cover. <laughs> so I prepared um, just a very short little quiz for everybody. Um, Oh, kind good, of a quiz. A quiz thinking about iconic book covers. All right. um, and supposedly a cover can convey a lot about the content. So I have a series of first edition book covers ah. um, from some famous novels. And I thought we'd kind of test your knowledge and see how many of these you can get right. Now I'm going to start you off with some easy ones. Okay. okay. Can you identify, and I've removed the titles for our listeners, okay. so um, <laughs> our participants today are only seeing the cover, just the imagery without any title or font information. What do you think about so, number one? Great Gatsby. Very yeah. good. Again I, with the eyes. I'm warming you up here, yes. The Great really Gatsby. Yeah. What about number two? Oh, to Kill a Mockingbird. To Kill a Mockingbird. Okay. Very good, Jennifer. <laughs> that was very quick. Number three. Jaws. Jaws. Awesome. <laughs> Very close to its movie um, poster right, as yeah. it was published. I like this one a lot. I think it's a really good design. Um, our next one. Catch 22. You can yeah. tell we're with librarians today. <laughs> Very good. Book. The next book. Cujo. Yeah, that awesome. would be my guess. I don't think I've ever seen it, but that and would just be the guess. This is a bit terrifying, I think, sure. as a cover with that imagery of the snarling dog. This one's a Ooh. little bit tougher. Oh. Um, gosh. Mm. Would you have a, maybe a guess based on the decade it was published and based on the, gra the graphic the design? Maybe the 50s. Okay. Maybe like Atlas Shrugged or... Oh. A good guess. Good I guess. I kind of thought it was uh, 007. Um, oh. Yeah. Was it Ian Fleming? Ian Fleming. Very good Not guess. Sure. Boy, I don't have a guess on that one. That... Yeah. And that and this one was actually um, the Invisible Man. Oh, okay. By Ralph okay. Ellison. So we have the imagery of the kind of the face indistinguishable. This one I hope you can get. I'm gonna Gosh, the Hobbit. Very good, oh, Jennifer. Great. I was gonna go with Magic Mountain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our next one. Animal Farm. Oh, Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. Very yeah. good. Oh, yeah. Very good. And our last one. This is a series. 
Uh, oh, guesses. Is that or as to the decade? Casino Royale. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, Ian the far left. James sure. oh, yeah. Bond by Ian Fleming. Okay. Very good. Oh, those are all. Yep. Okay. These are all, all right. different. Um, different titles from the James Bond series all right. by Ian Fleming. So, all right. good job. Um, you obviously were able to identify these pretty easily just based on how they looked. Um, just kind of showing us how much a book cover can communicate. So, well that done. That was a fun segment. Good, I'm glad you again. did it. I'll put these up um, on the website so people can check them out. All right. All right. Um, so I think our next segment is with our special guest, Jennifer. Um, and Jennifer is the science and math liaison librarian here at Madison College. We want to welcome you once again to the show. Thanks. Um, and today you were going to give us some, just some kind of background information um, on just why climate change information has been in the news so much recently. Right, so in mid to late January, uh, after the inauguration, a range of climate change information was removed from the White House website. Mm. Uh, and shortly after that, it was reported that information may be removed or edited from the EPA site. Um, and it has been pretty heavily edited now. Um, a mention of carbon pollution as a cause of climate change has been removed. Mm. Um, also federal climate plans, tribal assistance, programs and references to international cooperation have been removed. So this might signal that the new administration may not see global climate change as much of a priority. Mm -hmm. um, and the new head of the EPA has acknowledged that the, while the climate is changing and human activity contributes to that in some manner, he's also said that he thinks more debate needs to take place. Uh, to talk about the degree and extent to which human activity is actually causing the climate um, to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, 97% of climate scientists agree that climate warming trends over the past century are very likely due to human activities. Um, and most of the leading scientific organizations worldwide have also issued public statements endorsing the scientists' position. So Jennifer, why is this information so important? So climate change data, um, as I think we all know, can be used on a global scale to create climate models, mm. um, but also more locally, it's, uh, it can be felt too, because it can be used for things like agricultural planning, um, and also it can be used to model coastal flooding. So it really goes beyond just that global um, effect that it might have, and it also affects us locally. So it's librarians, one of our big tasks is to help patrons find information. And how does all of this affect our ability to, to do that? Yeah, so many of our go-to online resources um, in the past on climate change have been .gov resources. So things like climate.gov from NOAA, um, resources from the Department of Energy, the EPA, NASA, so if those go away, if they're heavily edited, or if they don't continue to be maintained, that makes it really difficult or even impossible for us to find those sources. Um, and prior to online resources, we would often have several print copies in multiple locations in different libraries, bookstores, um, and online materials have a much more ephemeral, ephemeral nature than that. So what you see one day could be very different than what you see the very next day. Uh, so we really have to consider how technology might change um, in relation to the container of that electronic info uh, and whether there's still an, a way to access that material into the future. So of course in the past we had things like floppy disks, CD-ROMs, uh, now we have cloud storage. And probably at the time that we had things like floppy disks we thought maybe they were pretty permanent. but uh, things change. Good point. So do you have any recommendations on where um, we can continue to access good climate change information? Sure, so in our physical collection of books here at Truex or any of our libraries, um, you can look in the Dewey range probably around the 363.7s, maybe in the 500s, which is kind of the science area for um, around probably 551.6 or 551.7. And maybe in other areas too, depending on the focus of the book. If it's economics and climate change or demographics and climate change, it would be in a different area. Um, also, of course, there's climate fiction, which is the focus of the book club this semester. 
and those would be um, shelved under the author's last name in the fiction section. Um, so that kind of covers the print materials. Uh, as for articles, we have access to a database called Greenfile, uh, and this is located on the EBSCOhost list of databases, and just ask a librarian if you need help finding that. Um, and Greenfile offers well-researched information covering all aspects of human impact on the environment. Hmm. Um, so that's a great place to look as well. Yeah, I, I like Greenfile a lot. So can you tell us, are there any organizations that are trying to preserve online climate change data before it is removed or replaced? Sure, so um, the Internet Archive is a really big organization that's trying to do that. Uh, they're a nonprofit digital library. Their purposes include offering permanent access for researchers, historians, scholars, people with disabilities, and to the general public to historical collections in digital format. Um, they're kind of known for their Wayback Machine, and you can put in the URL of most web pages, and it will show you past versions of that web page. So it's kind of fun mm -hmm. to look at. I've looked at our library website and past <laughs> iterations of it. Um, so it's pretty fun. Uh, they're also they also oversee one of the largest uh, book digitization pro projects in the world. Mm. Um, but kind of what they what they're known for is they send out web crawlers uh, to collect different uh, online digital material and then they store it in the archive online uh, and anyone can access it and look up materials. Also anyone can upload and download digital material from the archive. Um, and the archive attempts to create many copies of this material to help keep it safe. Mm -hmm. This can protect it from things like um, natural disaster or censorship. Uh, they have copies in places like Egypt, Amsterdam. They're based, I think, in San Francisco. And they have recently announced that they're going to build an Internet Archive of Canada. Uh, and I think they just uh, announced that after, after uh, the past election. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yay, Canada! <laughs> you mentioned the web crawlers, but the web crawlers can't capture everything, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, there is another project out there called the Data Refuge Project, and this was also launched in late November uh, after the election. And they work to identify and create trustworthy copies of data that may disappear um, and things that the crawlers might miss too. So uh, groups of scientists and librarians, they can do this on their own, but a lot of times they get together and host data rescue events uh, and they work together to identify and create these copies of data and store them in safe locations. Wow, that's really interesting. Where can we learn more about some of these efforts to preserve online climate change information? So Kelly actually recently shared a really great podcast with me uh, from the Slate podcast series called Working. It's a podcast with Lori Allen, a librarian at the University of Pennsylvania who's involved with the Data Refuge Project. And I would highly recommend this podcast. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jennifer. That was really great information. And I have a very important follow-up question. What was your opinion of uh, Lady Gaga during the Super Bowl <laughs> halftime? <laughs> I thought I thought she was good. She rocked it. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, and a lot of people uh, would agree. So. All right, it's time for the segment called Trivial Observations, and a quick trivial observation before we get on to the trivia question uh, for today. And the trivial observation is a follow-up to what we just talked about with Jennifer. And Jennifer mentioned um, at the federal uh, government level that uh, access to information about environmental issues uh, is becoming more difficult. I uh, just wanted to point out that just this last week, um, uh, in the early days of February, Madison.com had an uh, article pointing out that uh, the state of Wisconsin, after 100 years of a print magazine called uh, Nat Wisconsin Natural Resources, is eliminating the magazine. And uh, they're saying it's not for um, censorship purposes uh, or any issues with uh, the environment, just that um, the government shouldn't be in the business of publishing it. It should be more of a private venture. So if you're interested, look that up on Madison.com. DNR Magazine, cut scene its latest climate science scrub. 
All right, on to the question for this week, <laughs> and it's a two-part question. Uh-oh. <laughs> we didn't do so well last week. So <laughs> no, we didn't. We needed numerous uh, hits. And the question is actually also based on our conversation with Jennifer uh, today. Uh, Jennifer told us about the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine, um, efforts to try to preserve um, information on the World Wide Web. Um, and would strongly encourage people to look up uh, information about that and try to look up old uh, pages. Very interesting. One of the goals of the Internet Archive uh, is to create records of sites that have now become um, 404 file mm -hmm. not found. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, <laughs> the first part of the question is, according to legend, very popular legend, the infamous 404 came from a, a room in a, this organization's building back in 1992 during the birth of the World Wide Web. Can you tell me what uh, that organization, uh, the, the name of the organization, and also where it's located? <laughs> oh, I had no idea. Yeah, that's a tricky one. <laughs> and this is, a, again, a popular legend um, that a lot of people believe. Uh -oh. um, and it hasn't been, t I'm not sure that it's been totally dismissed, but um, it is considered more of an urban legend. And we'll get to the actual okay. factual answer in mm. just a second. But right. again, apparently um, the, they got the number from one of the room numbers in this building. Um, in 1992, when Tim Berners-Lee and others oh. were working on the development of the World Wide Web. Mm. Okay, <laughs> ready, ready for a clue? Uh, I'll give you a clue that uh, the location is uh, Switzerland. Oh, the oh. CERN. Very yes. good. good okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> and um, CERN is actually, um, it's an acronym for the French spelling. Uh, are you able to tell uh, me what no. the name of the organization is? In fact, I was going to say CERN, but I don't know what that stands for. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. Um, I remember it was one of the Da Vinci Code books. <laughs> it, it, uh, yes, yeah. Okay. Um, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Mm, um, mm -hmm. And the CERN acronym comes from uh, the French uh, spelling of that. All right. The second part of the question is, in reality, 404 actually uh, was was more likely uh, borrowed from what previous protocol to the World Wide Web? Ooh. Uh, it's a protocol that actually still exists, <laughs> I, I want to say. Is this like the... <laughs> Morse code. Morse code. And, <laughs> Well, isn't it like DOS operating? Well, you'll get a, um, think, think protocol, <laughs> and I'll give you a clue. There's um, three, three initials in it, and prior to three initials. to the, the web. Mm, don't know. Going once. The wheels are turning. <laughs> I promise Twice. they are. I can't and, and you'll kick there. yourselves. Uh, FTP file transfer oh. protocol. Oh, okay. Of course. Okay. All right. Yeah, DOS wasn't a protocol. It was just a <laughs> an operating system. It right? was an operating system. FTP. Okay. Oh, all right. That was good. Thank you. All right. So our next segment is um, our anything goes recommendation. Is this this is anything that you've a movie, music, um, a restaurant we've eaten at, whatever. So, Christina, you're first. So I thought long and hard, and I thought, well, maybe this week um, I would recommend an app, um, an app Ooh. I've been reading about, um, and it's called Signal. You might have heard it in mm -hmm. relation to, like, Edward Snowden and oh. um, people trying to escape sort of government um, eyes on communications, but I think it's as librarians in general, we're concerned about people's privacy and protecting right. people's mm -hmm. privacy. Um, so this had come up um, in reading um, some recommendations for how to keep our own information private. Um, and Signal, it's um, it's uh, created by the nonprofit Open Whisper si si Systems, and it's a way to send um, encrypted um, text, voice, um, and video messages now. So they just came out with a video call feature. 
um, and you can download it. it. It's on you know Google Play and the App Store, all that good stuff. Um, integrates with your phone, um, but apparently it, it protects the content of your messages uh, much better than the native um, applications that your phone probably comes loaded with. So okay. check it out if you're interested. All right. And have you cool. tried it yourself? Or? I have it downloaded, okay. and I only had one person <laughs> it could find that also in my contacts list that had it downloaded. So ho hopefully it'll catch on a bit more. Okay. All right. So my recommendation is um, the film Patterson. I, I saw it a couple weeks ago, and I, I just can't stop thinking about it. It was so good. It's directed by Jim Jarmusch and starring Adam Driver, who mm -hmm. has just had not hasn't had a flop yet. He's just making some really good films, and um, he's a a poet bus driver in Patterson, New Jersey, and he's lived there his entire life. And he's really someone that lives in the moment. He doesn't have a smartphone. Um, and so he pays attention to his surroundings, people's conversations. Um, in his poetry, he's inspired by things like matchbook covers and, um, uh, the, like I said, people's conversations and his wife. And, um, and him and his wife have <laughs> such a sweet marriage. And I can't remember the last TV show or movie where I was like, oh, they have a sweet marriage, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. So that was refreshing. And they also have a very cute dog, a uh, little bulldog. Aww. And um, so his wife, who also has a creative endeavors of her own, they really support each other in, um, in what they're doing and are truly excited and interested in each other. And um, to me, the film was about just how having some creative outlet, whether it be poetry, making cupcakes, or just working on your personal style that that enriches our lives and uh, probably would make us um, kinder people. Hmm. Ironically, I've seen the film as well. <laughs> okay. And um, I would agree that creativity is a terrific point and yeah. uh, being here um, in the proximity of the creator studio space, um, just the, the idea of uh, creating something, whatever it is, and you know, Despite the feedback that you get on it, or even if you want feedback, so right, exactly. Um, they're not they're not creating to like make a million bucks. Right. They're just doing it because it feels good. Their creative it, outlet. Exactly. I love it. So yeah. I recommend it. It's probably not in the theaters anymore because Jim Jarmusch films don't stick around. But um, it's it's really nice. It's a great date film. Nice. Okay, my recommendation this week is a nonfiction book that was published in two thousand nine called Bicycle Diaries. Uh, by David Byrne and if um, David Byrne sounds familiar um, it, it's because it is the one in the same the front man for the talking heads mm -hmm. and uh, this is a book of uh, vignettes by him whenever he went on tour or just uh, traveled he loves to travel the world uh, whenever he's in a city his preferred mode of transportation, if he can, if it any way possible, he gets a bicycle. Mm -hmm. He bicycles around the city and uses that instead of taxis or limos. That sounds great. And, um, you know, it's a much slower process, and he gets to observe the city and the way the city works and uh, the way people interact. So the book can be uh, enjoyed on a number of levels. It's a terrific um, travelogue. He actually writes really well, uh, although if you're a fan of The Talking Heads, you already know that he writes well. Um, he visits the cities that he visits in the book, include Berlin, Istanbul, um, Sydney, London, uh, San Francisco, New York, uh, and there's some others. Um, and it's a great travelogue. It uh, is also a terrific uh, analysis of um, cities and transportation. It's social commentary. Uh, it's a number of things, uh, much like a talking head song. <laughs> and uh, when you get to the end of the book, you may ask yourself, <laughs> well, how did I get here? <laughs> uh, great. Sounds really good. Um, my recommendation is the fantasy book the, called The Lies of Locke Lamora. Uh -huh. um, now, I listen to it as an audiobook. I have a pretty long commute, so that helps to fill my time. Um, but I'm sure it would probably be great uh, in print as well. It's by author Scott Lynch. Um, and it centers on an orphan named Locke Lamora 
who is trained by someone named Father Chains, along with other orphans, and he trains them to be thieves and con men. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a really clever, fun read. Um, they con kind of the upper echelon of society, but they also have a main villain in the book called The Great King. So it's a really great read. Sounds good. Have you read anything else by Scott I read, um, it's actually a series of, I think, three books. Um, and I just finished the second one, which is pretty good as well. It was a little different um, than the first one, um, but it was still quite good. All right. Okay, so um, that's our podcast for today. And I'd like to thank Jennifer for joining us. And you are welcome to come back anytime you want. That's right. Thank talk you. about more stuff. And next time on our podcast, we will have some new segments. And one that uh, Dana and I are working on is called Waiting in Westeros. So looking forward to that one. And um, The Other Mark has a new segment, too. Yes, The Other Mark has a... He couldn't be with us today. Um, but he has a new segment, and I'm not sure what he's calling it. So we'll look forward to that. That's right. Yep. And this has been a Madison College Libraries production in conjunction with the Creator Studio. Thank you, and see you next time. <laughs>